This episode was recorded before social distancing measures and travel restrictions came into place. There's a crisis in Australia, and it's getting worse. Latest figures show 116,000 people have no place to call home. And it's a problem that's not just hitting our cities, but regional areas too. Meaning homelessness is a frightening possibility for more of us than ever before. For these five high profile Australians, it's about to become a terrifying reality. You wouldn't have a dollar on you by any chance, would you? I don't want to bother people for money. That really sucks. I don't even know where the f I'm going to go. Is it fair that I got moved on? Yeah, it is. I never thought in my life that I would ever be doing this. I feel as unsafe as what I do. How can I possibly understand if I don't go through it? They've all agreed to swap their privileged lifestyles for 10 days of being homeless. They're going to find out what it's like to go from having everything to having absolutely nothing. Hey, bud, do you have a couple of bucks? I feel so useless. I'm lost. <laughs> I'm just desperate. I just want to sleep. This is like no way to live. That's not a life. So there's literally someone on nearly every park bench. Preparing to live amongst Australia's homeless are Deputy Lord Mayor of Melbourne, Aaron Wood. I know stats, I know all these things, but if I ever said I know what homelessness is, I think I'd be a fool. Restaurateur and entrepreneur, Pauline Nguyen. If you were to ask me what solutions there are, I don't know. I see it, I observe it. I would love to understand more. Comedian and radio presenter, Kieran Lyons. Growing up, my perception of homeless people was that they were dangerous people and did something to get there. Emergency doctor and businessman, Andrew Rochford. I genuinely have such little understanding. What do they need? What do they want? It's embarrassing how little I know. And model and social media phenomenon, Ellie Gonzalez. I've never found myself in a position where I don't know where I'm going to sleep, so it's actually really quite scary. In this series, you'll witness the shocking story of Australia's growing homeless crisis, from our cities to the country. And this is the palace. What it must be like on a permanent basis. I don't feel like you belong anywhere. A lot of homeless people work hard, twice as hard as a lot of people every single day. And the poor guy who bumped into me, he just absolutely smelt of urine. Through the eyes of five people willing to confront their privilege and face a stark reality. I'm sleeping right next to the homeless eye stealer. Don't touch me! But he's looking down on me, he's saying, you piece of filth. I was getting in a quite a dark hole. Babies babies that way. You don't use those PowerPoints there. Wires are actually life. Oh, the humanity. <laughs> this place is rough as f and there's ten men living here. This is a unique insight into what it's really like to be homeless in Australia. I woke up to a kick in the head, it was just pissing out blood. I feel like a posh twat. Wake up, mate. This is everywhere. You just have to experience to understand the gravity of the situation. Such a sense of loss, loss and emptiness. I just feel so sorry that people get treated like this. There's no going back now. No going back. Scary. Scary. I miss feeling safe. I can't talk anymore. I'm shitting myself. The five high-profile Australians have been told to meet at a warehouse near Redfern, Sydney. I feel quite anxious. You know, I'm somebody that likes to feel like I have a little bit of control. And right now, I have very little. They know they're going to live alongside people experiencing homelessness for the next 10 days. I'm scared, man. But other than that, they know little of what's in store. I'm definitely looking forward to totally immerse myself into something I know nothing about. So funny just like not knowing anything. It's gonna be a pretty tough and eye-opening experience, which, you know, this is this is exactly why I'm doing it. Guiding the five on this experience is presenter Indira Naidu. We have no real idea what's going to happen. 
but I'm absolutely certain it's going to be challenging and at times a deeply uncomfortable experience for all of them. Joining Indira is social researcher and homelessness expert, Dr. Catherine Robinson. They're at the start of a unique journey to try and understand one of the greatest crises of our time. But I think this is a journey the nation needs to take with them. Hello everyone. Well, for the next 10 days, you're going to experience what thousands of your fellow Australians face every day, homelessness. You're going to get a sense of what that means, what that feels like. For the first few days, you'll be sleeping rough. And you're entering into a very different world, one that you don't know and may not feel safe in, physically or mentally. Hearing that, how are you feeling? To be put out in the middle of the street with no access to my support network or any food or water is definitely yeah, very concerning. It, it definitely makes me feel nervous just to feel cut off as well, I think. That's one thing to care about weather and being hungry, but I, I genuinely think the moment when I feel like I, I just don't have that security, I think that's the moment when it'll get very real. I did read the weather report and it's uh, it predicted to rain for the next 10 days. <laughs> I'm not looking forward to the discomfort of the wet and the cold. I think if I can come away with you know, one misconception being uh, broken down by this experience or, or one new bit of information or understanding that helps me drive change, then, then what an amazing you know, opportunity that I've got. Aaron Wood is known for his environmental activism and education work with children, but is now in the spotlight as Deputy Lord Mayor of Melbourne. The Deputy Lord Mayor role is a title and it, and it brings power and influence. That's, that's what the role does. Aaron's also a successful businessman with investment properties and married with two children. But life hasn't always been this good. I went through a relationship breakup and my business went into debt. I had a full breakdown and if I didn't have mum and dad as a, as a safety net almost, then, you know, it, it's conceivable that I, I could, you know, end up on the streets. And as Melbourne's Deputy Lord Mayor, Aaron's been forced to confront the homeless crisis head on. It was the biggest issue before council. It was front page, it was national conversations, international conversations. So this is all about what more can I experience that will inform the response that we make. I hope it opens my eyes and, and fires me up. So before we send you out onto the streets, we need to take away all your belongings, your wallets, your money, your jewellery, your phones, everything. Okay. Any rings, wedding bands? Pockets all empty. Don't take it off of them. Do you watch? Back. Okay. As well as having their phones, ID and money taken from them, the five must now change. The tracky desk. They've also been given some spare clothes and a sleeping bag. But they're not allowed to access any savings, negotiate their way into accommodation, or seek help from friends and family. I'm trying to prepare for something that I don't really have any idea about. Yeah, kind of the uncertainty and the anxiety just keeps on ramping up with each little step at the moment. Since being here, it's been nerve-wracking and now it's getting towards crunch time. You know, getting the bag sorted, so I think I'm really starting to feel it. Well, now that you've changed, how do you feel about the clothes that you're in? It's really flattened me out. I just feel really flat. I think it's because I'm annoyed that I cared so much about my clothes. Maybe it's not the material nature of the clothes that I'm wearing, but it's the things attached to the stuff that we have. I'm not coping with it <laughs> as well as I thought I would. There's almost a, like a, a flip in power, if you like. We're going to walk out of here and not know anything, so there's a bit of that loss of control and, and loss of, of power that's a little unsettling as well. So you're all used to having choice, dignity and control in your lives, and that's been stripped away. You've lost your possessions and your connections with family and friends. And you can't make 
a plan. And this is what being without a home is like. This is homelessness. In a moment, four of you will be dropped off separately in different parts of Sydney and further afield. But one of you, your journey begins now. Kieran, it's time for you to leave. Shit. I wanted to give him a hug goodbye and <laughs> wish him well. That's really abrupt. <laughs> like, it's just like, bang. No. I think we're all preparing ourselves in our own little way and then he's walked out the door. So, you know, if you, you fall on hard times, you don't get to make a decision of when you're out the door. Not only are you you're losing everything, but you're losing that control over even when you get to go. There's, a, there's an element of we're kind of in this together and what's just happened is we're realising we're, we're probably not in it together. Well, we're not. You're going to be very alone. Yeah, I don't like loneliness. Alone's probably what worries me the most. And I know genuinely I'm going to need help. <laughs> well, if you haven't already been thinking about it, it's time now to think how you're going to survive out on the street tonight. But this is also your opportunity to immerse yourselves and embrace what's about to happen. Why do I go? More than 40,000 people experiencing homelessness are under the age of 25. And for Kieran, who's only just left the warehouse, the discomfort and disorientation has started sooner than expected. Where am I? Originally from Ireland, 22-year-old Kieran Lyons is a rising star in the Australian entertainment business. Living in Sydney is, is great fun get to get on stage, tell jokes, you know, present on the radio. Growing up in Western Australia, Kieran enjoyed a sheltered childhood. I had a very privileged upbringing. Um, I had really supportive parents growing up. I lived in Sorrento, which is a really nice area in Perth. It's close to the beach. So yeah, I feel like it was a really nice upbringing. And from a young age, he's been protected from coming face to face with homelessness. I still remember seeing this group of homeless people and my mum just putting her hand on my back and almost shielding me from them as we walked across the road to walk around them. And then as we got down the road, we walked across the road again. But now on the streets amongst Australia's 8,000 rough sleepers, it's Kieran who's about to find himself avoided and shunned. Excuse me, mate, do you have $3 on your money chain? No, no. Excuse me. You wouldn't have a dollar by any chance, would you? I don't actually think I've got anything. I'm sorry. Oh, no worries. Thank you. Excuse me, sir. You wouldn't have a dollar by any chance, do you? I'm sorry. I don't have. Excuse me, guys. You wouldn't have a dollar on you by any chance, would you? Sorry. It's just embarrassing. Just, I don't, want, I don't want to bother people for money. It's not... I wasn't... No one wants to bother people for money. I don't know how much longer I can go through putting myself through people giving me disgusted looks. A few k's away, Pauline's hoping she'll have more luck relying on the kindness of strangers. Excuse me, you wouldn't have to happen to have a spare banana, would you? I don't, unfortunately. I asked him for a banana, but he's got no more bananas left, so he's going to go and get me a mandarin from his car. Oh my god, thank you so much! That's alright. <laughs> it's okay, have a good night. Awesome. Thank you. I have two mandarins, a packet of chips. Over in the CBD, Aaron's planning for a wet night. I figure that it's going to give me a bit of insulation between the ground. Um, I know if I'm on a hard surface or even wet ground that this will at least absorb it. And over to Sydney's west, Andrew's been dropped in Bankstown 
where homelessness has increased by around 80% in the last census. It really sucks. I'm walking around in the dark. I don't even know where the fuck I'm going to go. Like, seriously. <laughs> Could not even look at me. If somebody makes eye contact with you, they very quickly dump their, drop their head. I just feel so useless. Just don't know what to do. Just getting like further and further out from the city, I know that. And that's not exactly a comforting feeling because it's just like you're getting further and further away from people who can help you. There are as many rough sleepers in regional and remote Australia as there are in the cities. Ellie's drop-off is almost 100 k's south of Sydney. So we're in Wollongong, which I don't know where the hell it is. Um, it is depressing as fuck. Oh, shit, it's cold. Ellie Gonzalez is a model and actress who splits her time between LA and the United States and her home in Queensland. I live in a beautiful house here in Brisbane with my partner Ross. We are on acreage and surrounded by wildlife. We love our cars and my dog Daisy. She gets taken to a doggy day spa like for a haircut and yeah we definitely do live a very very comfortable life but we've worked our asses off for it. Ellie's success has come despite the personal tragedy of her father taking his own life. When you're going through it, it's like, how am I ever going to come out the other end of this? But I believe you have to just see it as growth and like it, it just makes you a better person for it and getting through it. Boasting a social media following of five million people, Ellie has used her profile to promote oh, mental health son. issues. Asking them, are you okay? But you know, if you're in that spotlight and if you have the opportunity to create change, you know, you just, you just have to do it. But right now, in Wollongong, Ellie's aspirations are more basic. Excuse me, hi. Um, you wouldn't have, happen to have a cup of water, would you? Do you guys have any leftover food or...? Um, straight across the road, though, they have the um, free food. Yeah, the They have the Goodwill, so it's paid as you feel. Oh, really? Which one? Straight across the road, they have Goodwill. Goodwill? Oh, yeah. Are you guys closed? We are. Are you hungry? Yeah. Yeah, just food. Oh, yes, that would be yeah. so amazing. Like many regional towns, rough sleeping has become acute here. So much so that the Goodwill Cafe doesn't just hand out free meals, but tents for the night. Hey, Hi, thank you so much. You're a legend. I'm Ellie. Hello. Nice to meet you. you too. It makes me feel like someone's watching out for me for sure. Um, and that, you know, there's people out there who are actually, like, willing to help. See you guys. Have a good one. Back in Sydney's CBD, Aaron's found one of the city's many food vans and some of the three and a half million Australians who volunteer their time to homeless charities every year. I'll just grab a water. Water, thanks, man. Unbelievable. Changes everything. But for Aaron, charity might just be a double-edged sword. You know, that's, that's actually pretty easy. That's more food than I would eat at home. And I'm not being approached by someone there saying to me, hey, what's your situation? Do you need some help? And trying to maybe get me on a pathway out of homelessness. Does, does having, you know, access to food like that um, does it mean that some people might stay on the street for longer than the normal? That's, I think that's a question that, that's just in my mind at the moment because, I mean, that's amazing, unbelievable support.
So there's literally some on, nearly, on nearly every park bench that I'm work, walking past at the moment. Honestly, hits home just to think if that's someone's reality. Being the first night and coming across several beautiful souls who were open to giving, who weren't afraid of uh, a, a stranger. You know, we can make such a big impact when we can take the time to, to show a bit more kindness and show a bit more compassion. Like Pauline and Ellie, more than 40% of all people experiencing homelessness in Australia are women. And almost 3,000 of them sleep rough. I'd feel like sad, you know. This is sad. This is like no way to live living in a tent and like literally like setting it up every night, taking it down every morning. Like that's, that's not a life. It's not fair. Night one, living amongst Australia's homeless. And Andrews found shelter in Bankstown. Or so he thinks. All right, the police come down, they'll make a move anyway. Well, I feel like if something happens, it doesn't bring them out. Yeah, so I have to move on because the concern is that I'm obstructing a door. So the management of the building want me to move. I liked it under here because I could, I felt a little bit secure. And now I've got to try to find another spot, another setup. Far out. That was the perfect spot. It was out of the wind, it was out of the rain. I just want to feel safe. I just want to stop feeling anxious. Ah, oh, far out. Four AM. Sleeping rough isn't illegal in Australia, but bedding down on private property can be. Hello there. How are you? G'day, mate. I know it's raining and it's cold, but you need to get off the sites. Okay. Unfortunately. Yep. And we'll have staff arriving shortly anyway for the cafe. No worries. Thanks, mate. I'm not sure how much sleep I got, but yeah, getting a torch in the face and stuff is a bit of a um, bit of a shock in the morning. So, so is it fair that I got moved on? Um, yeah, it is. At the end of the day, is it feeling great now? No. <laughs> That's one night. I don't know how many nights like that. If you. If you haven't got a place to sleep, how you go. If you're getting moved on, especially at 4 a.m. in the morning. One in 10 Australians have slept rough at some point in their lives. And a few k's away, Kieran's struggling to cope with the vulnerability and exposure being on the street brings. I'm not used to being in the public eye while I'm sleeping. Like, I'm used to having my own bed in my own room, having that privacy where I feel like when you're out here, you know, you're hearing all the cars go past. You're hearing the footsteps. You're hearing the groups of people. You're even hearing the comments of people as, you walk, as they're walking past. So, yeah, you're just on public display the whole time. Already moved on from his rough sleeping spot, it's the struggle to deal with the utter alienation of being alone and on the streets 
that's hitting Andrew hard in Bankstown. I was actually too embarrassed to order, like, one thing. Thinking about what it must be like on a permanent basis to sit in a place like McDonald's and, and not feel like you belong there. Not feel like you belong anywhere. Your basic humanity is stripped so quickly. It's just, it's, I never expected this. I never expected to not be able to maintain the dignity associated with just being part of the society that I live in. In the CBD, that same sense of disconnection is enveloping Aaron. It's a really surreal feeling like they're almost just moving around me and, and I'm just here. If, if this was long term, if, if, if I was genuinely on the street, like you'd start to think, well, what, what, what's my purpose? What am I doing? You know, you'd, are, you, are you just being each day? You know, hopefully you've slept a few hours, you wake up, you try and get some for free food and a free coffee and, you know, maybe that's why you know, we have a lot of issues with you know, drug and alcohol dependence with, you know, people on the streets, because what, what else do you do? Like, seriously. The physical anguish of spending just one night on the streets is taking its toll on Pauline. I need to take regular breaks from the bag. It's fucking up with my body and my shoulders, but it is what it is. Pauline Nguyen is an award-winning restaurateur, author, and describes herself as a spiritual entrepreneur. An average day for me uh, starts at 4.30. I wake up and I pray and I meditate. My work day would start about 9 o'clock. All varied, whether I have my author hat on, or my restaurateur hat on, or my entrepreneur, or my teacher hat on. As a three-year-old, Pauline escaped Vietnam as a refugee with her family and her upbringing in Australia was equally traumatic. My father suffered terribly from PTSD, so we grew up in a very violent, um, uh, abusive household, and having to assimilate with nothing, <laughs> no money, no house, no job, but um, we've overcome all of that. As far as people experiencing homelessness, overcoming their trauma, Pauline's not willing to judge, but she thinks anything's possible. Do I think that there's a way out for some of the homeless? I simply don't know, I simply don't know. But on a humanity level, uh, I think a human being is capable of anything if they have the right resources. Right now, the only resource Pauline's looking for is a morning coffee. Excuse me, would you be able to buy me a cup of coffee? I don't have any money. Yeah, sure, thanks. Thank you. Hi, girl, please have a week one You're so very kind, thank you. What's your name? Sophie. Thank you, Sophie. I'm Pauline. Pauline. Thank you. It's all really good. Thank you so much. We <laughs> have a beautiful day. Thank you. Bye. Thank you so much. Kindness and compassion always makes me emotional. I couldn't imagine what it would be like to be someone that uh, can't present well for whatever reasons, for, for their, their history and their story. Back on the streets of Wollongong, Ellie's having mixed fortunes. I'm temporarily homeless and I was wondering if you had any jobs or I could like wash your dishes just for a little bit of money. At the moment, it's just a husband and wife turn we are home. I like it. That's okay. Thank you. Hi. I'm temporarily homeless at the moment and I was wondering if you should like some toothpaste or something. She just gave me so many toothbrushes and so much toothpaste, and she also gave me $10. She got so upset for me. Was that enough? Thank you. Meanwhile, Andrew's decided to make his way into the city from Bankstown, but it's come at a price. 
The Opal card cost me every cent that I'd earned. Begging. Dr. Andrew Rochford has forged a career in medicine, the media, and enjoyed a comfortable life in Sydney's well-to-do suburbs. I still live on the northern beaches, and I think that's because I, I had a taste of it as a child and understood just how good the lifestyle is. I'm able to have the things that I want for myself and, and for my family. As a junior doctor, Andrew was exposed to the sharp end of homelessness. At points when the coroner would need um, a death certificate for somebody that's been found, more often than not, it would have been people that are living rough, and um, it becomes a fairly confronting thing to deal with. And you kind of have ideas of a fairly sheltered life that you've lived. But despite his experience, Andrew admits he's utterly ignorant about this issue. I ran past the other day. It was really, really cold. And I thought, oh, should I stop and give them my jumper? And it was a moment where I realised I have absolutely no idea. I don't understand homelessness enough to be able to even make that simple decision. What do they need? What do they want? It's embarrassing how little I know. Now on the street himself, and less than 24 hours in, Andrew is learning fast. I feel like no one wants to see me here. I think my favourite was the guy who basically stepped over me. With so much change in his pocket, I could hear it jingling. I've, I've been the guy, probably, with the jingling pocket of change that's walked straight past someone. I've been that guy. I feel like I'm even scaring people. You know, when I just ask them politely for the time, they're scared. They're genuinely scared to tell me the time. You don't know the story of the person sitting there. You don't know it. So you either get to choose You either get to choose whether you want to think that person is there for reasons they don't control and just show some kindness, or you can choose to you drop your head and, and, be, and be afraid and walk away. It doesn't, it's not going to help. Excuse me, would you have a piece of cardboard that I could write a sign on? For almost 24 hours, Aaron survived on the streets of Sydney without a cent to his name. Thank you. Thanks very much. In his hometown of Melbourne, begging's technically illegal. Fortunately for him, that's not the case in Sydney's circular key. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks very much. Despite Sydney Cider's generosity, the experience is a conflicting one for a public servant trying to find solutions. It's mixed emotions because we're constantly telling people give to the agencies, don't give to people on the street. Um, and that's about trying to get them out of homelessness. But I think when when it's just right there and you just you want some food and you want something to drink, like. You're not going to go to the agencies to get that. You need the money right there and then. So, you know, all I've learnt all along is you don't give to people on the street. And then I've just, you know, had money given to me. And I, all I can think about now is I've got some food, I've got some water, and I've actually got money. And it's just, it changes everything. It changes the, the whole feeling right now. That experience just then has changed my view on, you know, whether or not I'll give money to people. For Kiran, the concerns are more rudimentary. Like, I want to go to the toilet. I want to have food. I want to shower. Everything's just a challenge. I'm starving. As Kiran grapples with how to survive on the streets, Dr. Catherine Robinson decides to check in. Hello. Hello, how are you? All right. How are you? I'm good, thank you. I've always been 
under the assumption, like, why, why, don't, why don't they just go get a job? Why don't they just hand in their resume at a fast food place? Why don't they just get a job? How hard can it be to go into an internet cafe, borrow someone's computer, do up a resume, and hand out your resume? And what are you thinking now? Now, being in this situation, and literally the only things and the biggest things are on my mind is, OK, I need this much for food, and then once I get food, I've achieved that, and then I need to find somewhere to sleep. The cycle that you've given me is food, money, sleep. Food, money, sleep. Mm -hmm. We need more than that to flourish as yeah. humans, don't we? Yeah. It's not just hunger or exhaustion that may be very significant barriers to trying to resolve rough sleeping. Mm -hmm. There's also for many people, a large um, well of grief that sits under rough sleeping. So that's another, I guess, burden um, and struggle that people are also experiencing, quite apart from all the physical issues uh, of being on the street as well. Well, just have a think about how limited your horizon, right, has suddenly become yeah. in 24 hours, right? Mm. Okay, well, good luck Thank you tonight. Very much. Take care of yourself. Keep yourself dry. I will do. Thank <laughs> you. I hope it doesn't rain. <laughs> no, I'm hoping so too. All right. As the day drags on, the deep sense of nothingness is becoming debilitating for Aaron. It just feels like every hour is two hours, three hours, you know? I'm just trying to pass time. It just gets you down. You know, two nights you can do, but you know, if I think about someone who's on the streets all the time, three, four, five, six, ten, twenty nights, what does that do to your mental state? If you haven't got a mental illness already, you're probably going to get one. It's estimated that almost 80% of rough sleepers have at least some form of mental illness. But research proves that disorders are often caused by homelessness. For Aaron, the evidence is plain to see. Yeah, just noodles, thanks. Um, just beef, thank you. It was really hard because the, the guy has obviously got the mental health issues. He he just kept talking the whole time, and it was interesting. Everyone, including me, you try and not get agitated by it, but it, it, it just gets in your head, like because all those disjointed thoughts coming out. It must be terrifying to be in his head. And the poor guy who bumped into me, like it, he his genes must have been just soaked in urine because he just absolutely smelt of urine, so um, that's really sad, you know. According to surveys, just one in three Australians gives to beggars. Something Kieran's continuing to find out the hard way now that he's also moved to the CBD. I'm homeless, I don't have any money. You don't give away sausage roll? Ah, oh, thanks anyway. Um, I'm homeless, I was just wondering if I could have a chocolate bar by any chance, please? Oh, so thank you, mate, thank you. It's, it's hard, like, it doesn't get easier. You know, they say, you know, every rejection you get in life makes the next one easier. Not when you're asking people for money. I think it gets harder. Excuse me, sir. You wouldn't happen to have a dollar on you, would you? Almost half of all rough sleepers have experienced physical violence, with women particularly vulnerable to sexual attack. Something Pauline's now contemplating at Bondi. It's an internal dial. I think especially as a, a woman, we know where it is safe to hang and where it's safe to not. And I'm sure there's plenty of uh, 
female homeless people, we, we know where, they're, where we feel safe and where we don't feel safe. And being here in, in this space um, with some light where I can be seen and it's open, where if anything were to happen for, to me, I can scream, I can speak, I can run. But being here as a female outdoors with no one around, in my normal life, I never feel unsafe 24-7, but in, in this life, we have to have our wits about us. It's not that we're not strong, it's we're, very, uh, we're a lot more susceptible to sexual violence and um, intimidation. You know, it's, it's not it's not a safe, a really safe world for women who aren't homeless, let alone women who are. You can't walk down the street without, without getting whistled at or yelled at by someone out of their car, let alone like me setting up a tent, you know, in the middle of two buildings to sleep. It's not safe. It's not safe for people to do this. Because I can't put a lock on this door. I can't put lights up to make myself feel safe. I don't have somebody who's in this tent with me to make me feel safe and protect me. I just have to do it myself. You know? It's a really scary thought. Night two, sleeping on the streets of Sydney. I don't know where to go. I'm, I'm lost. At this point, I'm just, I'm just desperate. I just want to sleep. The general health of rough sleepers is at far greater risk compared to the rest of the population. Dr. Catherine Robinsons decided to check in on Dr. Andrew Rochford, who's treated homeless people at some of Australia's busiest emergency departments. Hello. Oh, hello. How are you? I'm, I'm exhausted, but I'm better for seeing you. Uh, my back is sore, my shoulders are sore. My feet is my feet are really sore. My so longer term, um, what do you what would you expect to happen to your body? I, I've already I mean I've already noticed that I'm 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 more stooped over. My back is sore. I feel a lot older. I think I think this would age you. The acceleration in in aging that would occur physically would be. You know, I've felt it in 24 hours. Yeah. I feel 10 years older. But for these guys, like imagine yourself. In 24 hours, you're already feeling haggard. So thinking of that longer term journey that many people travel, I mean, what's the likelihood of them being able to access the kind of health care that they might need? I mean, how motivated are you feeling right now? Oh, not at all, not at all. I think physically the motivation would be low. I think mentally, that, I mean, the mental health stuff's the bit that I'm, I'm really, starting to you know, get a little bit of a better insight into and your mental health is what drives you to be able to have the confidence to find Absolutely. help. Absolutely. To have the, uh, the willingness to care what happens to you. That impacts everything else. It's just a vicious cycle. And I think that I, um, again, you, you know it in textbooks, you don't really know it until you really start to feel it. Does it surprise you then to know that the ex life expectancy for someone who's rough sleeping is 47 years? I knew it'd be low, I didn't know it was that low. Yeah. But 47, I mean, that's... That also gives you an insight into just how strong those experiencing homelessness have to try and be to survive. I mean, look at me, I'm... <laughs> I'm struggling after 24 hours. Yeah. You know, there are over 8,000 people sleeping rough in Australia on any given night. Do you think it's right? 8,000 people? Not at all. No, I mean, no one should do this. Not one. There has to be ways of making it so that, it, it, that no one has to experience this. Well, thank you for talking, and may it stay dry. Thank you. <laughs> Hopefully, fingers crossed. Having experienced rough sleeping for the first time in their lives, thoughts turn to the thousands of Australians who face this reality every day. I could never imagine that, that feeling of not knowing when that was going to end. 
I have the comfort of knowing that, that there's a point where this ends for me. But not knowing when it would end, I, I think that that would be such a huge, huge weight. I'd like to think that I've always had, you know, strong empathy for people less fortunate, but I just don't think I really understood the battle that they're going through. So, um, yeah, my heart probably um, breaks for people going through this. So I just feel sad that. Um, that we've got this system that lets some people down. Then they end up, you know, with no other option. I think that's a sad thing. Day three, living amongst Australia's homeless. And for some, it already feels like they're trapped in a cycle. The first day, it was all, okay, this is all new. And then now it's coming to the second day. And now even, you know, waking up to the third morning, it's like, this is, this is becoming routine. And it feels shit. Like, it's not a routine that I'd want. It's not a routine I can imagine anyone wanting. It's not even light yet, and I'm worried about it getting dark again. I, I've spent two days doing this, and I feel so... I, don't know, I feel so broken. With no idea what awaits them, the five high-profile Australians are being brought back to the warehouse. After just two nights, they've all experienced the kindness of strangers on the street. But this has been far outweighed for some by the loss, grief and pain that sleeping rough can bring. Hello, it's good to see you all. Well, you spent the last two days and long nights sleeping rough on the streets. You've all had varied experiences. And to be honest, one or two of you are starting to show the signs of that physical change. Andrew, what's been the hardest part for you? You know, to me, it started very, it started from the beginning, that sort of heightened sense of awareness to everything that was going on. And I think that that just, that just wears you down. It just wears you down. Like all day thinking, where do I sleep tonight? What's a good choice? Do I stay here? Do I go there? It just wears you down. Well, it's that constant vigilance, isn't it, that you experience when you're exposed in front of crowds passing by. There's no switch off, and that's incredibly draining. And Aaron, what's been the most confronting thing for you? Probably losing yourself. So you stop being you. Um, you're not the same person. I think above all that I've left myself behind. That's, that's the biggest realisation. Do you think the broader community judges rough sleepers too harshly? I'm guilty of it. I think the other thing that I've felt you know, through this is a bit of a sense of shame that you know, I've walked past people and thought, why don't you do something with yourself? And what about you, Pauline? What I was surprised about was the people who offered their time, their time. And just to be like around people who didn't like judge me or didn't make me feel less than was just one of the most amazing experiences. I'm gonna, I'm gonna get to sleep, I think. Kieran's not feeling well. Sit down, sit. A lack of sleep, food, and water have taken their toll. Leave that on for me, thank you. It's distressing what's just happened with Kieran, but it's not surprising. Rough sleeping is physically and emotionally draining. 
people develop health issues, they can't access water, they can't access food. These are the basic necessities of the human body that can't be attended to in the context of rough sleeping. Well, we saw dramatically the effect it's taken on your physical well-being. What was the lowest point in terms of your emotional well-being? Yeah, it has affected me a lot, like just mentally going back to that isolation and the rejection that you face. I mean, what I think about is the people who aren't in the situation where they get to go home at the end of this. Um, I thought to myself, well, I can probably last a few days without food, but you know, for someone who's there night after night, week after week, year after year. Like at the end of these 10 days, I can go back to my home. Sorry. Um, but they just stay where they are and they just do their best to get by. <laughs> But to be frank, this is just the start of your immersive experience. To truly understand the complexities of homelessness, you need to go a long way. So for the next stage, we're sending you back onto the streets. But this time, we're gonna pair you up with someone else who's sleeping rough, a buddy. Coming up tomorrow night, the five meet those who face homelessness every day in the city and in regional Australia. Here you go, Bubbles. This is the master bedroom come open plan, shall we say. And this is the palace, and I've been here going on a year. I just cannot believe she does this every night. I don't want her to be safe. A whole bunch of people come and sleep here. Ice users, heroin users. And then they discover what life's like in crisis accommodation. The word crisis means you're not coming there because everything's great. So you'd probably be sharing the space with up to eight or nine other guys. OK. They could say, and your time's up here, the 28 days is gone. Everyone has a right to feel safe. If you need immediate assistance or support, contact Kids Helpline on 1800 55 1800 or kidshelpline.com.au or Lifeline on 13 11 14 or lifeline.org.au.